Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So I'm Sandra Clark. I'm WHYY's Vice President for News and Civic Dialogue, and WHYY and our event partner for this evening, the Philadelphia Inquirer, welcome you to Making Sense of the Midterms. Now, I know all of you and all of us have a lot to say, so we look forward to tonight's conversation. So before we begin, I want to acknowledge the teams behind the scenes who made this event happen. So thanks to Philadelphia Media Network, Elizabeth Parks, James Huck Hutkin, and Mark Nichols, and Michelle Bjork, and to WHYY, Kareem Son, Joy Soto, Mohammed Wahid, Adam Stamchewski, and Dan Rosenthal. And thanks to all of you for being here. I know the weather is starting to change, so we thought, they're not going to come, and you did. Thank you. Um, so when we decided to do this event, little did we know that the midterms would still be going on, <laughs> right? What's settled is that nationally, the elections were dominated by the Democrats retaking the House and Republicans picking up seats in the Senate. But as we speak, there are recounts happening in Florida with counting machines overheating. I read today that one of the machines in Palm Beach uh, County is overheated, so 170,000 votes get to be recounted. Um, Runoffs in Mississippi, where one candidate says public hangings are a term of affection. And lawsuits are flying in Alabama as charges of voter fraud and voter suppression uh, abound. And races from Maine to California are still too close to call. So a lot happening. So in Pennsylvania, voters elected four women to Congress. A big change. Okay. Yep. And I guess the applause is because it was a big change for a delegation that had no women at all. Right? In New Jersey, a combination of retirements and voting out incumbents flipped four seats from red to blue, leaving just one Republican representing the Garden State in Congress. And in Delaware, every single statewide elected position, from treasurer to governor to the US Senate, is going to be occupied by a Democrat. So what's it all mean? I'm not going to answer that question. This is why we have this great panel here tonight. Uh, we have some of the top journalists in the re region and the nation on our panel. And let me get started by, started by introducing our moderator for evening, one of journalism's premier political columnists, John Baer at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. Um, and the amazing thing about the four women in the history of the great state of Pennsylvania, we elected prior to this election a total of seven women. So that's pretty good. Um, anyway, we're gonna have some fun tonight. We're gonna look at the good, the bad, and the ugly, and there's a lot of, of all three. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to a great panel. These are people that know what they're doing, have been doing it a while, and do it better than just about anybody else. Um, and they're gonna come up like NBA stars one at a time. So you <laughs> Holly Otterbein uh, covers politics and, uh, and, and bless you, uh, uh, politics and government uh, for the Philadelphia region, uh, for the Inquirer, the Daily News, and Philly.com. She also reports on all things outrageous, hilarious, and bizarre in the political world of the clout column. She previously worked for Philadelphia Magazine, NPR affiliate, the WHYY, and the Philadelphia City Paper, Holly. Jonathan Tamari is the Inquirer's national political reporter based in Washington, D.C. He reports on national politics and policy as well as uh, public officials and issues affecting Pennsylvania and Jersey. He's been based in D.C. since 2012 and before that covered the Philadelphia Eagles and the New Jersey, and New Jersey state government and politics, pro football and Jersey politics <laughs> being the best training ground for national politics. Jonathan Tamari. Erin Haynes Wack is the Associated Press's national writer on race and ethnicity. She covers the intersection of race, politics, and culture. She is an award-winning reporter who has worked at the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and the Orlando Sentinel. In 2017, she was named Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists Print Journalist of the Year. Erin Wack. And Solomon Jones, the host of Your Voice of Philadelphia's Praise 107.9 FM, 
Award-winning column appears weekly in both the Philadelphia Daily News and the Philadelphia Inquirer. He's also published frequently in national newspapers. Jones uh, also has been featured nationally on CNN, Nightline, NPR. Uh, basically, Philadelphia's king of all media, uh, Solomon Jones. And you know the voice, you love the style, WHYY's own Dave Davies has covered uh, local politics and government in Philadelphia for more than three decades. He has done it all in terms of writing about local and national politics. He's currently senior reporter for WHYY and a contributor and fill-in host on, for Fresh Air with Terry Gross. He was a reporter and columnist for the Philadelphia Daily News for 19 years. Before that, City Hall Bureau Chief for KYW News Radio, Dave Davies. My role primarily is to get conversations started. I hope that my colleagues will all join in once that happens. And I want to start a little bit differently. We'll get to the macro stuff, trust me. We'll get to the big issues uh, going forward. But I want to ask each of these guys and ladies who have been in the trenches of these midterm elections to start off from your own personal experience. Tell us something that really struck you about campaign 2018. It can be an anecdote, it can be a voter, it can be a candidate, it can be a trend. Something that got you as a seasoned journalist that you said, wow, uh, who wants to take that first? I'll take it. Um, I think for me it was the skepticism. Uh, there were a lot of people who, who believed, and I think uh, the 2016 election where you had one candidate uh, win the popular vote by three million votes and, and the other candidate wins the election, I think a lot of people believed that their votes didn't count. And so I do my own radio show and then I appear on another radio show on, on WRNB um, in Philadelphia. And so the host calls me up and says, I have this guy who does not want to vote. He doesn't think his vote counts, and so I want you to convince him to vote. And so I call up and I say, um, you know, where are you from? He says, I'm from North Philly. I said, me too. So um, do you work? Yeah, I work. Do you have taxes that come out of your check? Yeah, I do. Um, would you let anybody just take your money and do with it whatever they wanted? Just punk you and just do whatever they wanted with your money? He said, no, I wouldn't let them do that. I said, well, then you need to vote. Uh, because they are taking taxes out of your paycheck and they are going to use that, that money uh, to do whatever it is they want, whether it's oppress you, oppress your family, uh, uh, make sure that you are treated unequally, whatever that is, they're going to do that with your money unless you vote. Well, I still don't know. Um, and, and then I started talking about Donald Trump. I said, do you like what Donald Trump is doing? Well, you know, I don't think it really makes a difference to me. I said, okay. Would you let somebody talk about your mama? I mean, I, I, I had to get personal. <laughs> and I talked about the fact that Donald Trump, in uh, castigating the NFL players who were protesting, called them sons of bitches. And in doing that, really what you're saying is that your mother is a female dog. And so are, are you going to let them say that about their mother? And by extension, your mother, oh, no, I'm not going to do that, man. I said, all right, well, you need to vote. Um, and I think that the... The, the point of that is that people need to understand that it's personal um, and it's not just about the macro, but it is about how it affects you personally, how you feel personally, and, and what you care about personally um, in order to vote. I don't think most people know all the issues in detail, but they know how, how, how these people make them feel. And so that's the thing that, that was the takeaway for me. Holly? Um, people are really polarized right now and kind of dead set in which party they're in. And so I, I as someone who's covered a lot of elections, um, was pretty surprised by the number of people that I talked to uh, who were Republican voters, longtime Republicans or independents who were voting for Democrats. In some cases, um, straight ticket voting for Democrats. Just seeing how polarized things normally are, that was pretty surprising to me. Um, and then more generally in Bucks County, I was just surprised to talk to, it seemed like 
every third or fourth voter was someone who was a swing voter, kind of consistently, you know, a, a Democratic committee man who was going to vote for Brian Fitzpatrick, the Republican congressman, or a longtime Republican um, woman and elected uh, or elections official um, who said that she was going to vote for all Democrats. Um, that was that was really kind of surprising to me, and I think speaks to you know how weird a place Bucks County is, um, and and how much it's a swing district and kind of a bellwether for the country. Jonathan. So I had uh, an experience that struck me that was kind of a little bit of the opposite of what Solomon had, and is just the level of engagement that I heard from people who had always been interested in politics but never really involved in politics and became that way after the 2016 election. Uh, and there's like a number of stories I could tell, but the, the, mo the last one I, I, and the last person I interviewed that kind of fit that mold uh, was a woman named Andrea uh, Barton Gurney from uh, South Jersey, and she lives in a suburban district down in South Jersey. And she said she was always a dedicated Democrat, but she voted for her local Republican congressman because she thought he would be a moderate. And she was so upset with uh, both Trump's election and what the way that her local congressman voted uh, with the Republican Party that she got deeply involved in campaigning against him in uh, you know canvassing on Twitter and um, and this is again someone who had never been involved in local politics and she said to me look I can't do anything about Donald Trump right now but I can handle my local elections I can handle my local congressman and so it was an example of a person not just being angry, even though that was her initial reaction, but then really becoming very sophisticated about politics and how to get involved with it. Uh, and I think that I heard that story a number of times from people who never were that way. Um, again, knowledgeable, but not deeply involved locally. And so I think if we saw in 2016, a lot of people who were never involved in politics coming out for President Trump, we saw in 2018, a lot of people on the other side coming out in response to him. And it feels like we're headed towards kind of a clash of those two new, newly active groups of people uh, in 2020. Nice. Erin. Um, I think that what really surprised me, frankly, was white women. White women uh, who, a lot of whom, you know, the day after uh, Donald Trump was inaugurated, were out at the Women's March. They were angry. Uh, you know, in some cases, they either had stayed home or, uh, you know, maybe had even uh, voted against Hillary Clinton because of, of how they felt about her. But, but really, the quest there was an open question about how that was going to translate into, uh, you know, political action uh, going past that day. And, you know, also whether or not uh, there, there was a rift between those white women and, frankly, a lot of women of color who had voted against the president and who, you know, were seeing in his policies feeling affected by uh, some of the policies that he was doing from the travel ban immediately to, uh, you know, issues around uh, policing, criminal justice. Uh, you know, people of color were looking looking at, at um, their white neighbors and coworkers saying, you know, do you care about me? Do you care about what happens to me? And over the course of the past two years, and especially in this midterm cycle, uh, seeing white women really get engaged this cycle, not just as candidates, but as voters and as organizers, phone banking, texting, talking to their family members in a way that really they hadn't before. Uh, and it was because they were really reckoning with uh, what it means to be uh, a, a white person in America, what it means to be a woman in America, and to, and, and to really be in solidarity and to see themselves uh, as having a shared fate uh, with people who didn't necessarily look like them. Uh, I think that was something that I was not sure was going to happen and something that I was surprised to see happen in uh, a lot of these elections. Nice. Dave. I think one of the most intriguing things in this cycle is the emergence of elected socialists right here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, you might know that in western Pennsylvania there were these two women, um, Summer Lee and Sarah Inamorado, who knocked off, sorry, not, uh, they won Democratic primaries against incumbents who were part of a political dynasty, the Costa family. They were the brother, their opponents were the brother and cousin of the most powerful Democrat in the Pennsylvania State Senate, and they won pretty handily in those elections. In South Philadelphia, Elizabeth Fiedler, formerly a reporter here, uh, was elected in to, a, to an open seat in, uh, for state representative in South Philadelphia. She, by the way, does, does not identify herself as a Democratic Socialist candidate, but she was endorsed by the Democratic Socialists of America. They canvassed for her. 
Um, and then less well known is a woman named Kristen Seal, who really did campaign as a democratic socialist in Delaware County and came within three points in a general election of knocking off a uh, Republican incumbent. So I think this is fascinating in a number of ways. I think part of what we're seeing in each of those cases are people who mobilized a constituency. And I know Elizabeth Fiedler pretty well. And she just got out there and got a big, enthusiastic group of volunteers who just knocked on doors and knocked on doors and won, which is exactly what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did in the Bronx. The interesting thing is, if you look at Ocasio-Cortez, she was elected by winning 7% of the registered Democrats in that district. In a very small turnout election, if you can mobilize a constituency, you can win in a primary. But is it a message that you can take into the general election? And that's an interesting question as the Democratic Party tries to figure out what is its approach? What is its message, message as we go into 2020? Because you look in other parts of the state and you see two Democratic candidates for Congress uh, in, in, in the western part of the state who publicly said they would not support Nancy Pelosi for speaker and promised to work cooperatively with President Trump where they could. So you're really seeing this interesting tension develop but it's, these are just different times, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Um, that's some good stuff. Uh, let's talk about some ugly stuff. Um, this campaign, midterm throughout the country, we, we saw a lot of uh, racial rhetoric, and I'm, I'm interested in what you think the impact of that is. I mean, from President Trump on down, uh, certainly in Georgia, certainly in Florida, um, in Pennsylvania congressional and New Jersey races, there were a couple of television ads that tried to tie candidates to convicted cop killer Mamiya Abu-Jamal. So it's, it's like back to the future in some ways. And wh what does it mean? What's the impact now? What's the impact going forward? Uh, Aaron, why don't you start? Yeah, I mean, I think that what we saw was that uh, racism is still something that is in the playbook that does uh, work on some part of our electorate. Uh, you know, I think whether it was President Trump going out at his various campaign rallies and talking about the migrant caravan, something that maybe you don't remember because we don't hear very much about it now that we've had a midterm election. But, you know, leading up to the midterms, uh, you know, that was a message that he hammered when he was going out trying to, uh, you know, keep uh, control of the Senate. That was that was the message that he was he was talking about the caravan, even though it was thousands of miles away, even though. Uh, you know, the, the caravan was mostly made up of women and, and, and children and others who were fleeing uh, violence and danger, uh, you know, from their home countries. Uh, that was a message that did resonate uh, with some voters uh, in states like, say, Texas, but it also backfired in places like Nevada and Arizona in the House races that were there. Uh, so, so there was that. Um, from the onset of the general election uh, campaign down in Florida, you had Ron DeSantis talking about not monkeying up uh, that election, uh, you know, against uh, the, the man who was trying to become the first black governor of Florida, Andrew Gillum. Uh, and, and race came up repeatedly uh, in that campaign, uh, whether it was um, DeSantis uh, or it was, you know, somebody on his behalf making a racist robocall you know, trying to depict Andrew Gillum in this kind of minstrelly voice. Uh, you know, who, who is that supposed to speak to? Who, you know, what voter, uh, you know, what are voters supposed to take from a message like that about him? Or, you know, the president tweeting about Andrew Gillum as being un unqualified or, or Stacey Abrams in Georgia, somebody who graduated from Yale Law School as being unqualified uh, to ser serve as governor. What are, what are the coded messages that, that those are sending to, you know, a certain part of the electorate and what effect does that have? Uh, I think it does have an effect on, on some folks, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and and that, that certainly is not something new uh, in our politics, but because we are in a more racially polarized climate politically in this, in this country, and, and just really in general in this country right now, um, it, it, does, uh, it does feel somewhat more permissive uh, that we're seeing uh, this kind of language either from candidates or uh, from folks on their behalf. Everybody does not need to comment if they don't want to, but anyone is welcome to comment on that. Anyone? Anyone else? I would like to comment. Right. Oh. <laughs> I'm surprised, <laughs> Oliver. <laughs> um, I, I think that um, racism has always been here. Um, I think that the president's rhetoric, both on the campaign trail 
um, and while he's been in office, uh, has given people permission to, uh, to, to be vocal about their own racism. And I think the interesting thing is that when he ran, the polls showed that he was not uh, that he was not going to win. Um, but I think that that goes back to something that I heard when I interviewed uh, Mayor Wilson Good recently. He talked about uh, former Mayor Frank Rizzo when, when the two of them ran against each other, had this 38% that was very solid. Uh, but but many, of his, many of Rizzo's supporters wouldn't tell pollsters that they were gonna vote for Rizzo because they didn't want the pollsters to believe that they were racist. I think the same thing happened with Donald Trump when he ran for president. But I think the interesting thing that we've seen since he became president and continued that racist rhetoric is that people are more outward uh, with it. Um, you saw it in Charlottesville where people who were in the Klan took off their hoods and said, let's put on some khakis and you know, carry some tiki torches and just march down the street. Um, and I think you saw it in this election cycle where people were more comfortable with this, with this racist rhetoric, uh, monkey this up, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. Yes, you did. Um, and I think that people responded to that, uh, both people of color and I think people uh, who were white, who were offended by it, and, so, uh, and people who supported it. And so I think that, uh, that it galvanized people on both sides of that divide, and I think that it will continue to do that uh, as President Trump gives racist people uh, permission to outwardly show that both in their everyday lives, in their rhetoric, and in their campaigns. Mm -hmm. Holly. As you had mentioned, um, there were two really, really competitive congressional races in the Philadelphia area. I'd actually say they were probably the most competitive ones, um, Pennsylvania's first district in Bucks County and New Jersey's third, and they both featured ads wherein uh, the Democratic challengers to House incumbents who were Republicans um, were accused of having ties to convicted cop killer Mumia. Um, in both cases, the ties were thin if non-existent. Um, in, in the case of uh, one of the ads that was run against Democrat Scott Wallace um, in Bucks County, it was actually taken off the airwaves, which is really rare, right? I mean, how often is an, an ad actually so um, false that it's taken off the airwaves, but this one was that had accused Wallace of funding um, Mumia's uh, legal defense, um, which he did not. Um, so I do think that uh, those ads made a difference uh, to some voters. Um, I think I've heard from Democrats and Republicans, they thought that the ads resonated and made a difference uh, in the Bucks County race, which I paid close attention to. Um, they're not the only reason that Brian Fitzpatrick, the incumbent, won, not by any means, but I do think that they, um, they did resonate with some voters. And moving on. Um, I'm gonna phrase this indelicately, but hopefully you'll get what I mean. The, qu the question I have is, this was an election that we had an extraordinary turnout for a midterm. I mean, more people voted than normally voted. More young people voted than normally vote. So you have a broadened constituency all of a sudden uh, after, I think 2014 was the lowest turnout nationally in 70 years. So all of a sudden people seem engaged at levels that they haven't been in a long, long time in the United States and even in Pennsylvania. So the question is, when you broaden the constituency and you have a greater interest does that translate into policy? Do then the Congress, the legislature, start to deal with issues that people actually want them to deal with, whether it's gun violence, whether it's uh, income inequality, whatever the issue that a broader constituency wants, is this a change election? Will we see change? John, you cover the Pennsylvania legislature. You think they're gonna change? No, <laughs> no. I mean, this, the, the, the answer is always, well, we'll wait and see. We don't have to wait and see. I mean, uh, with the I, don't, I don't think we're going to see very many major policies, if at all, in the next two years now that we have a divided Senate and a House. Uh, I will say that in speaking, I've been working on a story just about what these newly elected Democrats want to do now that they have the House majority, or at least what they want to pass that symbolizes what they want to do, even if it's not going to make it to the finish line. Uh, and a few people have brought up uh, without any prompting, student loan debt. Uh, and that to me is an indication of people uh, 
recognizing some of the engagement of more young people uh, in recent elections um, and, and an issue that obviously predominantly affects young people. So it's at least putting issues, I think, on the radar. Um, you know, I, I don't think that all of a sudden they're going to be the number one constituency. I still think folks are, are going to be more concerned with Social Security and Medicare and, and things that are more pertinent to, um, you know, older Americans who do still vote a lot more. But I think there's been enough engagement that these issues are coming on the radar. Um, I think the new engagement, as we've already discussed a little bit, of suburban women has already forced both parties are going to have to grapple with that. Democrats as to how to hang on to them and Republicans as to try to how to kind of survive and win back some of these districts that used to hold. So I do think it's having an effect. Um, I wouldn't expect to see a certain policy in the immediate term, but I think you know, that's how these policies eventually become law is that it, it's a slow build over years and years that it's on the radar and then it moves to the top of the priority list. You know, John, the reason I threw that question at you about the legislature is that I think you know, the people who hold the levers of power mostly still hold the levers of power, and so it's going to be hard to make them move. But it is interesting to me, I mean, this is like now a couple of elections in which the youth vote, which always w was this untapped potential. I mean, if people who looked at the demographics of actually who votes could see, I mean, the st most striking example was in the Democratic primary last year, 2017, when the uh, millennial turnout tripled to a whopping 10%. It had a m massive impact, again, on a low turnout Democratic primary. And I think that you saw people turn out in bigger numbers in this election, and I think people will feel that. I think the voters themselves, the young voters, will f they'll feel it, they'll feel the impact of that, they'll talk about it to their friends, and I think you have something that could grow. It'll, it takes a long time to, to impact policy, but I think there's an electoral impact. Well, and the corollary yeah. to that is what happens if there is no change? Do people who were enthusiastic and turned out then go back to their former selves? Yeah, I mean, I think that remains to be seen. But I, I think to Jonathan's point, a, a lot of these folks that, that were uh, elected in uh, the so-called blue wave, I think that they are going to have the spotlight, uh, you know, as this new Congress convenes. And they are already, you know, on the Hill figuring out where their offices are and taking their class picture and all of that. But they're also, you know, talking about climate change, talking about income inequality, talking about what the leadership uh, of this of this new Democratic Congress is going to look like, and so I think you know even though they lack seniority, they are going to have a voice, and and people are going to be paying attention to them because they are the bright, new, shiny uh, faces in Washington. Uh, so I think nationally, that's definitely going to be a, a thing. But I think uh, at the local level too, uh, while there may not be change, I think there's definitely going to be a response to uh, this new broad coalition and all these new voters that we're seeing. And what I mean by that is a lot of times when you have uh, when you see uh, a lot of interest in voting, we know that, that um, greater turnout usually does bode well for Democrats, right? And so uh, in Republican-controlled legislatures, and that still is a lot of our, our state legislatures, uh, you may see the response to that in uh, legislation around voting, uh, whether that's legislation around early voting or around um, budgeting, you know, for elections. Um, you know, people are going to be thinking about creative ways <laughs> to uh, maybe uh, suppress the vote, uh, unfortunately, in some cases, because uh, they know uh, what kind of effect that that has. Uh, it, does have, it does have a partisan effect. Anyone else? Yeah, I, th I think that, um, you know, I wrote in my column today about an issue that I think is of, of critical importance to the black community, and that's police brutality. Uh, black people are two and a half times more likely than their white counterparts to be shot and killed by police. Um, it's even worse, much worse for young black men. They're 21 times more likely than their white counterparts to be shot dead by police. And so uh, given that Democrats lean so heavily uh, on the black vote um, in order to win in these elections, uh, it's, it's my view that they have to address the issue of police brutality. And I think that politicians uh, change that they uh, pursue policies when they are pressured to do so. Uh, whether it's through the, the, the threat of being voted out of office or, or through bad publicity or publicity of any sort while they're in office. And so I don't think you can discount uh, the, the effect of social media and the effect of activism. I think you've seen Donald Trump use social media to great effect uh, 
uh, to move all kinds of people from uh, media to uh, his supporters to his opponents. And so I think that you will see people um, pursue policy if they are pressured to do so. But if they're not, uh, if we do what we normally do as an electorate and elect people and then think that they're just going to fix our lives, you know, um, then they won't. So it depends, I think, on what the electorate does now. Speaking of social media, let's talk a little bit about the greatest influences on political races. Is it campaign ads? Is it the news media? Is it social media? Who's driving attention to and reaction to political campaigns? Yeah, I think social media is playing a huge role just because uh, the screen time is so much greater for most of us. Good, uh, you know, is that the, a good thing, a bad thing? I, I think that just is where we are. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's good for the digital advertisers. I mean, it's good for Facebook, right? Uh, it's good for Twitter. Uh, I don't know uh, how that bodes for the electorate. I mean, I think that you definitely saw people being more engaged. I mean, uh, Facebook and Twitter also, and Instagram also did uh, encourage people to register to vote, provided information about voting. Um, you know, the, the voter selfies and, and, and voter uh, kind of emojis, you know, to help people kind of promote the fact that they were voting, making it, you know, kind of this national thing that we all felt connected to. That, that was a thing that, that maybe... Uh, contributed to voter turnout. You know, if you see all your friends doing it, you don't want to be left out. And so, you know, maybe that gets you out in the rain where maybe you weren't going to go vote that day because it was raining. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think uh, there are probably good and bad things about that. Uh, for people who kind of have fatigue over ads, you know, you're switching off your television because you don't want to see an ad and then no sooner do you look at your phone than, you know, you, you can't, <laughs> you can hardly post a tweet without, you know, seeing somebody popping into your feed saying, you know, don't forget to vote for me on, on election day. So, uh, you know, I think I think that there are pros and cons to that, but I, I think this is our new normal for sure. Mm. I, I get the impression that folks on social media or doing politics on social media tend to be the people who are already really engaged, um, that there are people who are, are deeply interested in politics and would probably be following these races anyway uh, in, in on the whole. Uh, when I was out, when I spoke with a lot of voters, I still felt like they were getting heavily influenced by TV ads. I would talk to voters and hear, you know, when I asked them why they support a certain candidate, they would repeat back almost word for word sometimes, uh, you know, something that one of those campaigns was really advertising heavily on. I remember being in the Minneapolis area and, and one of the Republican congressmen out there was trying to talk about why he was independent from his party and he had a more, you know, he was more for environmental protection than a lot of Republicans are. And I spoke to a guy and he was like, yeah, he's, he's against drilling in, in the boundary waters. And, and I said that to the congressman, he's like, oh, great, our ads are working. Um, so I think that the ads really still do for, for, I think they reach maybe a wider audience and maybe are more likely to reach, still reach that audience that's not necessarily following politics and needs it put in their face. Mm. One of, one of the measures of this is you look at how campaigns spend money. And I've been following this for years. And most sophisticated campaigns now have a digital advertising component. But the, you look at something like the Congressional Leadership Fund, which was the Paul Ryan super PAC that spent, God, what did they spend, John? $50 million in this campaign? I mean, much, most of it still goes to television. Now, partly that's because TV ads are just much more expensive, more expensive than digital right. ads. But you know, historically, it's older people who vote and older people still watch Jeopardy, and ads on Jeopardy are still very expensive. Um, it does seem to me, and I, I think we wanna, we're gonna talk about negative ads a bit, and I brought a couple of examples, but that there's just this kind of diffusion uh, in the addition of voices. I mean, there are social media, uh, and there's talk radio, and there are more actual media. I mean, there was a day when, you know, John and the Inquirer would dominate the coverage of a given race. And now there's just a lot more voices. And I think there's a diffusion in, when you ask the question of kind of who's driving campaigns, who's influencing the most, gosh, that's, it's a really good question. I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's a mix. I mean, I absolutely think TV ads are still just a big part of it. Social media is obviously on the rise. I think we in the news media often underestimate the role that we also play um, in terms of what we're focusing on. There was a reason that President Trump, who's very savvy when it comes to media, was drawing attention to the so-called caravan in the weeks leading up to the election and now 
isn't really talking about it as much. Um, I talked to a Democratic political consultant um, a, a month or so before the election and asked him, you know, are Democrats going to take back the House? And he said, well, tell me what's on the news three days before Election Day, and I'll answer your question. Um, so I do think that we play a, more of a role than we often um, think. And speaking to what Dave was um, talking about earlier, knocking on doors still makes a real difference um, in local races. And that's something that's rarely talked about at the same level that we talk about things like TV or social media. But um, that really made the difference for campaigns like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and then here locally, um, the campaign, I think, for Elizabeth Fiedler and, and some others. So we did bring some ads. Uh, and Dave, you think the ads generally are getting worse. Hard to believe, isn't it? I mean, I, it, it, you know, I mean, I think all of us who cover campaigns find it a, a stomach-turning experience to just be immersed in all these ads. But it just seemed to me that just like there were the standards were always low, and now they almost seem to have disappeared completely. So I want to bring a couple of examples. Mohammed, um, let's play um, the one that's called "Irresponsible." This is an ad attacking Scott Wallace, the Democrat in that Bucks County race. Parents are stretched pretty thin. Soccer, band, tutors, family dinners. But one person doesn't think it's hard enough. Scott Wallace wants to tax families of five for, quote, irresponsible breeding. We know because it's where his money went. Scott Wallace gave almost half a million dollars to a population control group. Their plan? Families of five are taxed to the hilt. Scott Wallace for Congress? Now that's irresponsible. The NRCC is responsible for the content of this advertising. Okay, so that's an ad from the National Republican Campaign Committee, which is an independent group that, that runs ads in races. And the basis of this, that he believes in penalizing people for irresponsible breeding, is that the family foundation that he heads, actually a few years before he actually became the president of it, gave money to a population group, which 30 years before, apparently, according to a Fox News report, had had a pamphlet which had this idea of irresponsible breeding. The fact is that the, the population control things that the foundation itself funded any time Scott Wallace had to do with it, had to do with universal access to, to family planning and birth control and fighting genital mutilation in Africa, et cetera, et cetera. PolitiFact Pennsylvania, did a fact check on this, rated the, the ad as false. I wrote about it, others wrote about it, and this is what the NRCC followed with. So, Mohammed, let's play this. This is uh, Mocking Scott. No, Scott shouldn't be mocked. Breeding is irresponsible. Big families should be taxed. Scott Wallace has radical values and funds radical causes. Over a million dollars to promote socialism. Funded Alternate, which pushed conspiracy theories linking Cheney to the anthrax attacks. Scott Wallace even gave cash to a politician who blames America for the September 11th attacks. That's radical. That's Scott Wallace. The NRCC is responsible for the content of this advertising. All right. So, you know, what you see here is they go too far, they make a stretch in a claim, they're caught, they're called on it, they're criticized, they don't care. They don't care. Use it again. Um, and you see this time and time again. I, um, I called a, a, a political message guy, a, a, a Democratic media consultant who'd been doing campaigns here and around the country for a long time, and I said, am I imagining this? Is this getting worse? He said, you know, 10 years ago, there would be a debate in a campaign about whether we could use the term lie, whether we could call our opponent a liar. Now, when you finish the ad, but, hey, wait, we forgot to call him a liar. <laughs> um, he seems to think it's getting better. Seems to me it's, at worst, seems to me it's getting worse. And what the heck do we do? I wonder if my fellow panelists agree. And I think part of it is, is again, this diffusion of sources of criticism. You know, I just think there's sort of no voice that's powerful enough to say, cut it, cut it. Before, before we hear comments on that, um, I, br I, brought, I have one ad that I liked for its pure technical genius. Uh, this is a Lou Barletta ad uh, run against uh, incumbent, still incumbent, incumbent to be uh, Senator Casey. 
And the beauty of this ad is how it was done. It was done so well that a neighbor of mine, a little bit older, but still sensate, was going to vote, asked me afterwards, how did they ever get Bob Casey to do that? Or who got in on Bob Casey's office to, to make that happen? Where do you see it? I'm Lou Barletta, and I approve this message. You know them, the do-nothings, the lazy ones, the slackers, yet somehow they still grab a paycheck, like Bob Casey. For decades, <laughs> Casey's been sleeping on the job, writing almost no legislation, and rated one of the least effective senators. Twice, yet Casey's been paid over $3 million from the taxpayers. Pennsylvania deserves better. On election day, let's send Bob Casey a wake-up call. So what do we think? Things getting worse? Not enough guardians at the gate? I mean, I think it's easier for people to, I think it's easier for campaigns to find some justification because as Dave mentioned, they're able to get some news outlet. There's so many news outlets they can go to to find someone to bite on some thread of fact that they then use to build up into these ads. And we should be clear, we've run a couple of Republican ads here they come from the Democratic side as well. They're, we could have easily found those as well. Um, but I don't know that two or four years ago we had really these high-minded, issue-based campaigns either. No, um, we have never had that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it's maybe easier for folks to get around the fact-checkers, but I, I don't know that the ads are, are worse than they mm -hmm. were. I think they were pretty far down to begin with. Yeah, and I think... Uh some of some of the worst of, of 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 what has been out there is just coming back, right? I mean, I think about in particular uh, the immigration ad that only briefly aired on television but was retweeted by the president. Uh, you know, that ad immediately brought to mind for folks uh, the Willie Horton ad uh, from the Dukakis Bush race, right? Uh, so that type of thing, even though you know it, some people found that ad to be highly offensive and problematic, was. It, in fact, uh, you know, a reminder of another ad, you know, from, from 30 years ago. And so, um, you know, that doesn't make it worse. That just, that just means that, that we're seeing a resurgence of, of something that we kind of thought we, uh, was beyond the pale for us, uh, you know, as a country now. But, but it turns out, uh, no, <laughs> uh, may, maybe we won't put it on TV or, or let's put it on TV and see what the backlash is and then take it down, which is what ended up happening with, with that ad. Uh, but, but there were others that, that um, to your point, uh, were put out, disproven, and, and folks were just doubling down on because those kinds of ads can work with voters. Let me just bring up one leaflet because this relates to what Aaron was just talking about. Uh, Mohammed, can you bring up uh, Extreme Liberal? This, is a, uh, this, is a, this shouldn't take as long. This is a PDF. It's a flyer that was run in a Delaware County State Senate race against Tim Carney, who is the mayor of Swarthmore. Do we have that, Mohammed? Um, I think a Muhammad sleeping like Bob Casey back there. <laughs> no, he's great. Okay, so this is Tim Carney. Meet the extreme liberal Swarthmore resident Tim Carney. He supports sanctuary cities. Now, now, now let's see the next one, which is sanctuary. This is the flip side of that ad. Um, I'll have to do the same thing again, but uh, nice big thing. Again, flip side of the ad. Okay, so this is Ramon Vasquez, right? This is compared to the Willie Horton ad. This is a child rapist who uh, got out of out of a, a jail after. Uh, a, a, an ICE detainer was not honored and went out and raped a five-year-old. And so Tim Carney, the mayor of, of Swarthmore, is associated with the child rapist on the basis of what? If you actually look at the, the credit, uh, I mean, the source that cited for Tim Carney being even in favor of sanctuary cities, it relates to something called the Swarthmore Working Group, which I looked up, and in fact, there was such a thing. It did study the notion of a sanctuary campus, and Tim Carney was not a member of it, he was not on the advisory panel of it, he had absolutely nothing to do with it. And when I called the State Republican Committee, they admitted that. They said, yeah, well, 
he could have he could have criticized it and didn't. I mean, that was the level of you know documentation of some pretty nasty stuff. Uh, he, uh, Carney won, by the way. This ad was not successful in turning enough voters against. Him. Yeah, anyway. I was surprised when um, Mayor, when uh, President Trump tweeted the anti-immigration ad. A lot of people called it like the most racist ad that had ever existed or had existed in a long time. And I thought I've seen local ads like that in the past few years. And you know that was one example of a kind of anti-sanctuary city, anti-immigration ad that we see a lot um, that'll tie candidates to, you know, really, really horrible criminals. Um, so I think sometimes we see these broader trends locally first. Yeah, I, I just, I don't think that the ads are getting worse. Um, I think that there's no accountability uh, for those. I mean, who's going to do anything? You know, it's out. People have seen it. Oh, sorry. Oh, it wasn't true. Okay, well, you know. But uh, I, I think about Swift Boat Veterans for Truth. Uh, and what they did to John Kerry. If you can find somebody with an ax to grind, uh, you can have them say anything and people will believe that it's true. And so, no, I don't, I don't think that things have gotten worse. I think that, um, you know, people are, are pushing the envelope to see what they can get away with like, these, like they've always done. Um, there's always been coded racist language. Uh, even right now, people are getting Ku Klux Klan literature on their lawn. So what is a pamphlet? Like nobody... You know, so I don't think that things are getting worse. I think that um, there's no accountability for it, and so people do what they can get away with. See, I agree, Solomon, and I think they're related. I mean, I think that years ago, when ad watches started, campaigns were a little more careful and a little more responsive. And now, you know, there's just there's no dominant media, there's no dominant voice, and and I have to say, when the when the president. Uh, can utter so many uh, untruths, which just kind of go out into the ether and get challenged, and then we all just move on. There's sort of a coarsening of our standards, which just encourages people to just just say anything, just say whatever you want, say it in any way you want, and you pretty much let it ride. And to your point, Dave, I, I will add that what I think is different, you know, before you had third parties that were doing a lot of this stuff, right? So that candidates at least were allowed to distance themselves mm -hmm. from a lot of this, uh, you know, kind of some of the uglier stuff. Now, that is no longer the case. You have, in some cases, parties putting, putting these out, if not the candidates themselves, uh, and, and, and the president retweeting it. So, um, yeah, I think that that is maybe a thing that, that is different now. Speaking of the president, um, and particularly to, uh, to Aaron and uh, John Tamari, uh, you, you two have been traveling around the country and then to everybody else who work in Pennsylvania. What, if anything, have you seen uh, to suggest uh, Trump's re-election in 2020 or not? Uh, Trump carrying Pennsylvania in 2020 or not? What's your sense from being out on the road? Does this election truly have an impact going forward or do we make too much of one election? I think it's difficult to necessarily make predictions off of this because the, obviously the president was not on the ballot. He did not have that single Democratic opponent who was running against him that people would have to weigh uh, the pros and cons of. I think in going to some of these other, you know, one of the reasons I did travel was that we knew that there were a lot of seats here where Democrats were going to do really well and we wanted to go and see some other places where Republicans were still doing well this year. And uh, so I was in Indiana, I was in northern Minnesota uh, as two of the stops. and. You definitely see, um, you know, again, one of the other people I spoke to is he was a union worker, worked in a mine. He said, I was always brought up that if you were poor, you voted for Democrats. But, you know, Trump is coming in and he's taking care of Americans and, and I'm going to do what's best for my family. And, and so you heard that sentiment. And um, so that still resonates, I think, in a lot of parts of the country. I think that the results in the Midwest, in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, show that Democrats can still reach a lot of those voters who swung to Trump in 2016. It shows that they still have a clear path to winning the presidency. Uh, if I was a Democrat, I would be more concerned. I think they might almost have a harder climb with winning the Senate because of the number of rural states where the president is still really popular, and it's a pretty narrow path for Democrats to try to recapture that. Um, the last thing I did want to say on that, though, is that you find people are more you know, the story of this election, and I wrote about it a lot, is how the suburbs really went more, the swingy suburbs really swung strongly towards Democrats and being blue, and, and the rural areas really strong even, even more strongly away from Democrats and being even deeper red. 
Uh, but when you talk to just regular folks out in these areas, you really do find such a different mix of opinions um, that there are really more nuances than you're even able to report or read about in a story. You know, I remember in Minnesota, I spoke to, I've happened to, the, the group of people I spoke to happened to lean a little more heavily Democratic than Republican, which was surprising. Um, maybe that's just the kind of person who's more willing to talk to a newspaper reporter. Uh, but I was at a place and I saw a guy who had these work gloves and he's talking about the hockey game. And I'm like, all right, this guy, this will be a Trump voter. Let me go interview him. Uh, and he worked in Duluth, which is near the mining area that, that uh, the Republicans really want to open up for even more mining. He's, and he turned out to be a waiter. So white, 50s, working class male, um, definitely a Trump voter. Um, but he said, look, I work in the restaurant business and we have great beer here because they cleaned up Lake Superior. And if they open up the drilling and mess up Lake Superior again, that's, that's my economy or my jobs are going to go away. My job is going to be hurt. And it was just a reminder of the nuances that exist and the different ways that we think about working class workers and, and just different demographics. So I guess that's all a long way of saying that it's really unpredictable. 2016 was unpredictable. I think 2020 will remain that way. Aaron, what'd you see? I mean, hey, I'm still making sense of the midterms, right? I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I, I can't call 2020 yet, but I, mean, I think uh, what I will say is, you know, it's going to be interesting. A lot of it is going to depend on, to your point earlier, how much uh, of this energy and enthusiasm that we're seeing now, how that is mobilized and sustained over the next two years, right? I think uh, the energy that we saw coming out of the 2016 election, coming out of Trump's inauguration, there was a question about whether or not that was going to translate into um, into the midterms, I think that we've seen that it has, but then what happens over these next two years? Because it's been a long first two years, right? I mean, I know as reporters it has been, I suspect <laughs> for a lot of you, it has also felt like a long two years. Um, you know, so so trying to keep that enthusiasm up is, is definitely um, going to play into how uh, 2020 uh, how 2020 goes. But, you know, uh, so I spent a lot of time in the South. I spent time in Georgia. I spent time in uh, Mississippi. Uh, but also paid attention uh, to Alabama, to uh, Florida. And, you know, I think that, I think that, that what we have seen, even in the races where um, candidates may not have won, I mean, obviously we're still waiting to find out what happens in Florida and Georgia, but even if they do not win, I mean, more people voted for Stacey Abrams as a Democrat than have ever voted for, I mean, she got more votes than any Democrat has ever gotten in the, in the history of Georgia. So, you know, that may, maybe she didn't win, but that certainly shows that the Democratic Party is, is going to look very different in 2020 than it did, you know, in years past, uh, you know, when President Obama, for example, was able to come close in 2008 and 2012, but he wasn't able uh, to take those states. Look at, look at uh, how competitive Florida was. Beto O'Rourke lost in Texas, but not by much. You know what I mean? So I think that, um, you know, the especially with the idea of one person one vote you know where people 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 who may be living in districts that are just highly gerrymandered who may be feeling oh my vote doesn't count it doesn't matter if you know if every single democrat votes in this in this district because this is not you know a democratic district but if it's a statewide election now that's a different conversation if it's a national election now that's a different conversation this is a this is a place where maybe i do feel you know motivated to come out because i do feel like my vote may make a difference i definitely heard that from folks especially rural black folks in a lot of these southern states because they're in the middle of trump country a lot of them you know they know that voting in their local elections uh you know may not necessarily get them the representation that they want but voting in a national election can make a difference let me get one more question in here and then we'll turn it over to you you can ask questions of any or all of these folks. Um, this is something I'm interested in because I heard a lot of it and I want to know if my colleagues have heard a lot of it. Throughout the campaign, uh, phrases that crossed my email and phone messages and social media were fake news, fake polls, enemy of the people. How much of that did you guys experience? I, I get it in my emails all the time, every yeah. time I write a column. Um, in terms of people being so, um, I think, stuck in, in their own uh, party, so stuck in their own race, so stuck in their own class, uh, that they cannot hear anything 
that is, is outside of their belief system. Like anything that, that they haven't heard on Fox News is just not true. Right. It's fake, it's not true. I don't care how many statistics you have. I don't care how many studies you have. I don't care how many facts you have. It's just not true. It's, it's cognitive dissonance. And so I think that um, because we are so, uh, so partisan now and, and so split on so many different levels, I think that as a, as a journalist, you can't help but hear that uh, because uh, there are going to be people who disagree strongly uh, with what you with what you write, what you say, what you do, and and they're going to let you know about it. And unfortunately, because of email, because of comment sections, uh, because of Twitter, uh, they they can get to you now very quickly. And so I think that that all of us hear those those terms, but I think that's just the world we're in now. I think that's definitely true. I mean, I, I just came back from Georgia uh, this past weekend to write about voter suppression. Uh, there was a precinct where, you know, thousands of people came out to vote and were met with three working voting machines. And so their wait was three, four hours long uh, to cast their ballot. And so I went down there to tell the story of that precinct, wrote the story, and sure enough, the emails came in, you know, what, what are you talking about? Where was the voter suppression? These, sounds like these people got a chance to vote to me. Why do you have to keep perpetuating, you know, this fake narrative? Uh, you know, uh, four, four million people voted in Georgia, you know, under the Secretary of State. How can you, how can you say these things, right? And, and I think uh, that definitely spoke to the partisan piece that Solomon mentioned, but also uh, the bottom line was a lot of these folks uh, who were uh, reaching out to me to, to complain about my story did not know anybody that had experienced anywhere near a wait time of that long. You know, so that they had not either personally or, or through anybody that they knew had no familiarity with voter suppression. Whereas most of the people that I ended up interviewing for that story either experienced voter suppression themselves or knew somebody else that had, yeah. and routinely so. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get a lot of that directly, so, um, but it, it, is, it is among the most troubling things, I think, that we see in the nation right now. You know, we, in answer to your earlier question about where we are for 2020, this week I did a chart, which you can see at whyy.org, and if you just find Google it, I mean, I compared Trump's margin in every one of the current Pennsylvania congressional districts in, in 2016 to what the Republican congressional candidate did, and you can just see it was a big, big difference. So to the extent this is a referendum on the president, it is very good news for Democrats. At the same time, just conversations and polls tell you that there is a huge proportion of this nation that believes the Washington Post and the New York Times, that people that do what we have been doing for years, try to be thorough, try to be fair, knowing we can be sued when we get things wrong, they th that, that many people think we make stuff up is just, it is chilling to me. It is just really chilling. And, and I don't know how long or how you get out of that. Okay, we're ready for <laughs> you. Ending on a high note. <laughs> uh, questions, yes, sir. All the folks who ran saying they weren't gonna vote for Pelosi. And then they get down there and they say, okay, who are you voting for then? So who should it be, if not Pelosi? How do the Democrats start figuring out who their next gen of leaders are? Where are they coming from? Did you see any, anywhere in any of these elections? I mean, the challenge is that right now there is no alternative to vote for. Uh, Nobody has put him or herself forward to run against Nancy Pelosi. So, um, you know, I did speak with, yesterday I was speaking with one of those Democrats who said he wouldn't vote for it, uh, Jeff Andrew from South Jersey, and he said he's sticking with that but it's not clear who he is going to vote for. Um, I think Democrats have a lot of work to do to find that next generation because their House leadership has been stagnant for so long. There, is not been, there has not been people who've moved up the ranks and are, um, there's really no heir apparent right now. Um, so I think it's a dilemma. I think it's something that Pelosi is, and her people around her are probably very well aware of. Um, I would be surprised if there isn't some kind of olive branch or some symbolic move at least when Democrats choose their next leader. First of all, I'd be shocked if she's not the speaker. Uh, she just, they just took back the majority under her leadership. Uh, but I would be also be surprised if there was not some kind of move to signal, here are some new people who are going to come up through the ranks. I don't know the way that that would take place, but um, I don't think 
I think that message has gotten through enough that there would be. And if not, then it's malpractice on the Democrats' part because they are going to need new faces soon. Yeah, and to your point, I think, too, uh, where you might see, you know, even with her being the speaker, and I agree with you, I think that's probably what, what's going to happen, uh, you know, in terms of priorities and policy, I think that you're seeing folks say, you know, look, uh, black folks are part of the reason why you've got this House majority. The reason that you get to be speaker again is is because of black folks, is because of people of color, is because of women, right? So I, I think that that could translate uh, in terms of the uh, priorities that, that she's setting. I mean, I think we already saw, I think this week, uh, uh, annou the announcement that there's going to be a diversity office, uh, you know, in, in, in the House, uh, you know, trying to get some more diverse uh, staff, uh, diversifying the staff and prioritizing that, uh, you know, that is something that I think is a direct result of, of these midterm uh, results. And so I think that maybe you'll see more things kind of like that, uh, even with her, uh, you know, coming back and, and, and reclaiming the, the speakership. Yeah, I, I think she's going to be the speaker as well. But I think that your question speaks to the problem that the Democrats have for 2020. Who's the candidate? Who is the candidate? Who is the consensus candidate for the Democrats who can beat Donald Trump? I mean, say what you want about the man. The man knows how to run a campaign. He knows how to win a campaign. And so who are you going to run against him? Is it going to be an old retread or is it going to be somebody new? Is it going to be somebody fresh? And I think in order for the Democrats uh, to win in 2020, they have to have somebody who is inspirational, who is aspirational, and not somebody who is a retread from the 1980s. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. I'd like to get your opinion. My opinion is that this election has brought about a lot of changes because of the fact that when you start to think about how many people fit into the 1%. So when you get away from the 1%, everybody else's life is based on, am I going to get a good education? Am I going to have health care? What's going to happen to my elderly? And then when you start to take about talking about voting, you're going to take the people who are immigrants to this country. They're going to take voting serious. The people who are concerned about education and everything, they're going to take it serious. And my question is, no, they will not. The, one, the people who are the 99% are going to speak up when it comes to voting. What do you think? I, I think that, um, and I just have to be honest, I think that the brilliance of racism is that the 1% makes the people in the 99% who look like them think that they're part of their success. When in reality, they're being oppressed like everybody else. And so I think that uh, we have to find those things that we have in common. And that's why I go, I go to inspiration. Like it, it has to be, you have to have someone who can, who can put that puzzle together for people and let them know that no, um, your interests are really the same. Your interests are not any different no matter what you look like. Um, and so, We'll see what happens with that, but I think if someone can get that message across, uh, then you'll see greater participation in, in 2020 and beyond. And I think you saw it with healthcare somewhat too, right? Because healthcare was really the number one issue for so many voters. So much so that you had Republicans out there saying, you know, we're not gonna take away pre-existing uh, conditions. It's like, wait a minute, wait, wait, when did, we, when did we change the playbook on that, right? But that, that was their message headed into the midterms because they knew that health care was a priority for their voters as well, even voters who maybe, you know, had said even two years ago, get rid of Obamacare, you know, or who voted for Trump because he promised to get rid of Obamacare. All of a sudden it was health care is very important to me, uh, you know, no matter which side of the aisle uh, folks are on. So, yeah, I think um, shared interests are, you know, are, 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 are going to take pre priority over shared allegiances. I hate to rain on your parade, but I'd just add that um, when you look at voting rights among different people um, of different incomes, people who are low income are always much less likely to vote than those who are middle income and higher income, partly because of the voter suppression that Aaron has um, done a lot of investigating on and many other issues. Um, but I think that is going to remain probably for, for the foreseeable future, um, barring some major changes. 
And, and remember that the rules for campaigning are not fair. I mean, you've got no limits on money in politics now due to a couple of Supreme Court rulings, and that just makes it tough. It makes it tough. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Pick somebody. <laughs> oh, he's, he's, he's got, got the mic. Oh, we got one. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you for having this conference, WHYY, for the Delaware Valley. But my main concern is, and I'm happy you're doing this, um, and any of you can answer your feelings. Do you strongly believe in a two-party system? And also, I find when I watch TV, sometimes these celebrity reporters, not that it's you or other ones, okay. they sort of antagonize the candidate just to make the headline for themselves. How do you keep your emotions out of it? Or, and tell us some of your experiences where you did confront candidates and fight with them. That sounds like a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, personally, I mean, I don't fight. I get yelled at a lot uh, by candidates, sometimes on the phone, sometimes in person. Um, Ed Rendell famously would leave me voice messages that were so angry that he, you could hear the spittle. Um, and he'd call from the car, and the car would get out of range, so then he'd call back, and the next message would be, yeah, it's me again. And then... Uh, and we're off to the races. Uh, no, I agree with you on the point of celebrity journalists. Um, there are too many instances where, and it's most notable in broadcast, where people uh, make themselves the story or make themselves a part of the story. It's really not about the journalist. It's about getting readers and consumers as close to the truth as possible. So while I have angered a lot of people, I've never ever fought with anybody. Most journalists aren't on television, you know? I mean, most of them are pounding away in their offices, you know, getting data, making phone calls to, to people on all sides and trying to assemble information and trying to do a thorough and fair job of it, I think. And, you know, the celebrities tend to get a lot of attention, right? It's easy to watch them. But I think, you know, what we, and we've, I mean, we've certainly gotten, had, had contentious conversations with candidates before, but it's our job, you know? Yeah, it's part of the deal, and it's universal. I mean, even mild-mannered Tom Wolfe has barked at me, if you can imagine. <laughs> sure. Thank you also for, for being here and doing this. Um, do you see any value in, instead of when the president tells one of his far-fetched tweets, instead of trying to bring people back to the sanity of the truth, just saying, the president lied again, and making the lie the headline instead of the facts of the matter? Is there any, any value to that? <laughs> I mean, he's lied so much. It's, it's, I think it's hard to, at this point, I think that the, the scariest part of uh, what's happening with this president is that he has normalized Lying. I can remember, I'm old enough to remember when uh, calling a candidate a liar uh, was, was a terrible yeah. thing and something that could cause them to lose the election. Uh, whereas with, with, uh, with this uh, candidate now president, um, he has normalized the lie. And, and I think that we spent so much time hand-wringing over whether we were going to actually call him a liar when he lied? Are we going to say uh, he stretched the truth? Are we going to say he told an untruth? Are we going to say that he was mendacious, he was fallacious, you know, whatever? Um, instead of just saying he lied. Um, I, I think that uh, we in, in this business are, are partly at fault for allowing this to become normal. And so I think there is absolutely um, um, value in just saying, no, that is a lie, and then explaining why that is a lie, and then giving the reader or, or the viewer uh, the chance to digest that information and respond however they feel is fit. I want to say, I, I've heard this a lot um, as well. I feel like there is, and, and I think that when there is a clear lie, it is our job to say it was a lie. I do think that sometimes we are overly fixated on using that exact word. Because I think, as a reporter, if you lay out facts, 
that and people can reach their own conclusion, that is more powerful than being told what their conclusion should be. Um, you know, I think to, I remember I was asked about this, happened to be asked about the, the lie question right around the time that the Harvey Weinstein story broke. Uh, and I was thinking about that, how that story was done and it was just a powerful uh, documentation of the facts of what he did. And nobody needed to put in the story, this was disgusting and inappropriate because if you read it, you knew it. And I think that's the same case when somebody says something that is just uh, contrary to all facts that you have and you lay that out, it's obvious to anybody who wants to get to the truth. And it's more powerful when people read the facts and are not being told what they should think but are able to easily come to that conclusion themselves. So I do think it's appropriate at times to use the word lie. But I think that if journalists are laying out saying the president said this, and in fact, here's what the truth is, that that is as powerful and that um, using that specific word does not change the, the reporting. I don't think that that makes a reporting more or less valuable. And I think we risk preaching to a too narrow of an audience um, if we come to be seen as saying that we're basically piling on or taking one side or the other. Well, I'm a columnist, so that's, that's my job. Right. My job is to is to give my opinion, to look at the facts and, and, and to give my opinion. And so um, I understand, you know, from, from a straight reporting point of view, uh, what Jonathan is saying, and, and I can see the value in that as well. But uh, for me, my job is to uh, look at the facts, um, explain the facts, um, and then give my opinion and, and let the chips fall where they may. And so uh, as a columnist, I'm committed to doing that. I'm a psychologist, and to me, this president is all about what people feel, not what they know or what they think or what's true or what's not true. And I'm just curious if you see it as a singular trait with him or if that was successful in races across the country. Is it a time-limited phenomena, or has it become part of who other people are? Interesting question. I think people are always are almost always voting more on gut instinct than mm -hmm. they are on a detailed analysis of the policies. I think that's always been the case. I think Trump happened to be really skilled at tapping into those gut instincts of people, at developing a, a deep loyalty and affinity that you don't normally see to political figures when you talk about these rallies and people standing online for hours to get in these rallies, there's very few politicians uh, who are able to command that kind of loyalty. And I think people react with their guts and then they kind of sort their policy priorities based on you know, who they feel the most affinity for. And I think in this case, you've even seen people reverse where they stand on specific policies because the person that they, because of where Trump is, either you like Trump, so you know, whatever he says you're going with or you don't like Trump. So whatever he says you're going against. Um, I think the gut instinct is always more powerful uh, than, you know, a detailed policy analysis. I agree. And, and frankly, I think that you, I mean, the exact opposite of that we saw 10 years ago this month when we elected Barack Obama. Like people felt something around him. I mean, these our past two presidential, uh, our past two presidents have been somebody who people were very emotionally uh, attached to, either in a good way or a bad way, right? People, people, you. I mean, there is no real in between about either one of them. Like people either loved or hated Barack Obama. People either loved or hated Donald Trump, right? And so, uh, it's funny to me the idea that that you have to be excited about the person that you were voting for for president is a very new phenomenon in this country. People have not always been excited about the person that they were voting for for president. You know, uh, but that is something uh, that, that is kind of beginning to be a prerequisite for people, and not just president, but, but down the ticket as well. Uh, it, it, it's not um, so much a matter of pragmatism anymore or, or you know, telling somebody that it's their civic duty is not enough anymore. It's like, am I, does this person really make me feel excited do I feel like this person cares about me uh, that is that feeling is 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 a very strong uh, motivator I think for folks uh, but but especially now you know I agree and I think there's a connection to the to the last question um, there's no question that it's that 
people are more motivated by emotions than facts and that Trump taps that really well. And part of what he taps is anger and fear, right? And so, you know, the enemies of the people and the lion media and all that, which is why I feel like, getting back to the question of how you deal with untruths that the president states, it's, the media, because of its conventions of reporting, would had trouble with this the first few months. But I think they've gotten around to, to clearly pointing out his divergence with the facts. You know, the president falsely stated, the president stated without evidence. And I think it's important because I think we have to maintain um, that posture that we are going to be thorough and fair, even when people don't believe it, even when they're being told that we're making things up. We have to resolutely present that voice that you know we believe in telling you the whole story. And I think if we get into people thinking that we are fighting the president, I think it feeds his narrative, gives them more reasons to be angry. It's hard to do, but I think we have to stick to it. Hi. Good evening, and thank you all. Thank WHYY, um, and thank you all for being here. Um, first, I definitely want to thank you uh, for speaking about how some women of color might feel. Um, I'm definitely one of those people who I'm still grappling with that. I constantly say that I recognize now that I feel as if all white women aren't allies of my humanity. Um, and that's a very hard thing to deal with. Um, I, I just can't get to the kumbaya just yet. Um, but something else that you guys said, and I mean, you guys made lots of great points. So when you talk about the democratic socialists, right, that are running or, or some that have been elected, I'm like, are they really democratic socialists? Um, or are they, are they just real people who um, were very good organizers, right? They, they got out grassroots, organized, and got out the vote. Um, because even when you um, alluded to Barack Obama, well, he also was an organizer. And he knew how to get out there and, and do grassroots um, organizing. So I, w I wanted you to speak more to that, or your opinions on it. What, what's the question again? Do you believe that there's really this surgence of democratic socialists? Or, because I mean, I don't think of myself as a democratic socialist. I think of myself just as maybe radical or something. I feel like the, the language, you know, whatever the term is, perhaps has changed, but I don't think it's something different or new necessarily. I think it's, it's the same. And I think that they're just real people that know how to go out there and organize. I think they have a mindset, though. I think that they have uh, a specific view of the world. Uh, I think Bernie Sanders kind of popularized that, that term, democratic socialist, because you didn't really hear that before. Um, and, and when I hear it, it's almost like, you know, well, what is a democratic socialist? Like, socialists think we should all share everything, and Democrats think we should vote. So do we vote first and then share everything? Like, what is it? You know, but, but I think that it's a popular term, and I think you're right. They are very adept at organizing, and I think it's because they have to, uh, because it's, it's not a new mindset, but it is a new term. Um, and I think that uh, they've been very adept at doing that, and I think that you're going to see other people with other ideologies kind of picking up some of their um, methodologies that they've used in order to, in order to win. I mean, in the case of all the candidates that Dave had mentioned earlier, these are people that describe themselves as democratic socialists. Um, so I'm not going to say whether or not they are. They're self-described as that. A new phenomenon this uh, campaign cycle is that we started to see people actually identify as that um, and, and brag about endorsements from the Democratic Socialists of America. I mean, I remember when I saw my first flyer that it was a state rep candidate boasting about an endorsement from the Democratic Socialists of America. That was just something I had never seen before. So it is definitely a new phenomenon um, and, I, and I don't expect it to go away. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that it was the organizing that got each of those. And it's interesting that they're women, isn't it? I mean, all of them. And that, that they 
that was the key to getting them elected. But you're right. I mean, for the past more than half a century, that was the kiss of death to call yourself a socialist in American electoral politics. And the fact that it isn't is kind of interesting. And I think you can clearly see more openness to things like whatever you want to call it, single payers or you know, Medicare for all or socialized medicine and really taxing uh, the wealthy. I think those ideas have a resonance that they haven't had in a lot of years. Um, how far it goes, I don't know. Um, we did pass the mic over here. Um, last year or after Hurricane Maria, I remember seeing a lot of stories about literally hundreds of thousands of people from Puerto Rico who were registering to vote in the United States and the impact that was going to have in the midterms. And that doesn't seem to have occurred. And I'm wondering whether that was just hyperbole or whether there were, that was part of, you know, they were victims of voter suppression or if there was some other explanation, especially in Florida, where you look at the margin between <laughs> Gillum and DeSantis and compare it to you know, Bush versus Gore and it's not even close in terms of how close it was. Um, so you know, is it just not true that a lot of people from Puerto Rico registered to vote in Florida or, what it, or is there some other explanation? Frankly, I think that's a story that's still left on the table. I mean, obviously we're still trying to sort out what happened down in Florida, but, but uh, what was the uh, Puerto Rican factor in either Florida or New York? I don't know. You know, but I think that I think that we should be looking into that, and I think that we should be. That is a story for us to follow up on and and report about. Uh, obviously, we've been a little busy with some other stuff, uh, but I think that I think that that definitely is one of the ones to look at because uh, we don't know how many of those folks are going to stay here uh, headed into 2020, uh, and we don't know, you know, because uh, the, uh, if they're on the mainland, you know, their voting uh, rights are, are are a little different, and so if they have decided to settle or if they have figured out that they either can't or don't want to go back, uh, you know, how do those folks, um, how do those folks factor into 2020? Could we see, some, did we see some of those folks actually run for office or may they, might they run for office uh, in the next two years? You know, that, that's certainly something that we need to continue to pay attention to. I don't know who has the microphone. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a question looking towards 2020 in a different way, towards the census that's coming out and redistricting. And a big root issue for me and my activism is putting an end to gerrymandering. And I'm curious what you saw in this election in terms of moving towards ending gerrymandering and more fair drawing of district lines. I mean, this election in Pennsylvania really showed the power of um, gerrymandering and, and changing uh, congressional district maps. Um, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled that the map that was on the books was unconstitutional. They redrew the lines. And um, after that, uh, three seats were flipped in Pennsylvania. Um, I don't think that at least two of them probably would have happened without that, uh, and maybe maybe all of them, frankly. Um, I mean, that's that's a factor in this election that's acknowledged by both Democrats and Republicans alike, that, that a major reason for the Democrats being able to flip so many seats um, in Pennsylvania is because of the new map. And I think one of the underrated, you know, they weren't the most exciting races, but Democrats winning the governor's office in Michigan Wisconsin holding the governor's office here in Pennsylvania means that when redistricting happens, they will have some seat at the table, unlike what happened in Pennsylvania when it was one party rule and the map reflected that. So I think that's an under the radar story that will have an impact going forward. Unless I'm sure you probably uh, follow the redistricting group that, that Eric Holder and Barack Obama started. I mean, they targeted uh, places where they felt like they could make an impact, flip some seats and maybe make a difference uh, in terms of redistricting. So I think that, um, you know, depending on how things shook out with them, you're going to continue to see them try to have an influence, uh, you know, headed into 2020 because these are the people that are going to be redrawing uh, these maps uh, at the state level. And so that's going to continue to be a priority, I think, for Democrats especially. Yeah, I think in Pennsylvania, though, you still have to just realize that Republicans still have the majority um, and they know how to give Governor Wolf a hard time. And so it's going to be a battle. But I think that uh, there will be fairer lines not necessarily just because of Governor Wolf, but I think because they realize that there is judicial oversight and that you know they, they can't just do what they've done in the past. So we'll see. The other thing to bear in mind is that in any congressional map, once incumbents have run there a couple of times, 
they've gotten to know their voters, they're a little less reluctant to kind of go yanking them all over the place just for some partisan purpose. John, you were going to make a point about this. About Well, I mean, Republicans are well aware of this. You have to remember that the congressional changes in, in Pennsylvania were for this cycle and the next cycle. The process that gave us among the most gerrymandered districts in the country is still in place. Mm -hmm. And there's an effort underway among Republican leadership in the State House to keep it that way and to use the same process they use in legislative reapportionment at the congressional level, which would take both the governor and the Supreme Court out of the process. Because at the congressional level, because the Constitution makes no specific, you, you just do it. You don't need a bill. You don't need the governor to sign it, uh, which is how we ended up you know, with what we have. So going forward, there's going to be a fight on the process. There's still Fair Districts PA is still very, very active. Draw the Lines is very active. Committee of 70 is very active. It's going to be a lot of pressure to put in a new system, get an independent commission, but Republicans are still in control, and they're going to have some ideas of their own. Hello. Hello. Um, this has been a wonderful activity, and there were several questions that you posted that have practically been answered with the activity. Number one, what sort of determines the, the electoral, the, the people who vote? Who, why? Because of media? Because of uh, the, um, the new uh, ways to use the, um, sorry for, I, I got carried the away. Digital the, media, right? the yeah. digital media. The digital media. I think basically, Panels like the one we're having and a lot of, of TV programs that are taken into consideration that we are respected thinkers allows for that to make us to make a decision. Another item that you mentioned is how fear and anger are manipulating. And then are we forgetting the essence of our values? We live, for example, in a beautiful city like Philadelphia. Built up, go to Carpenter's Hall. What does it represent? Okay, go back to your history and think. But I'm not here to tell you that or ask you about that. I'm here to answer one of uh, the young man's concern is, what about the Puerto Ricans? I am a Puerto Rican. I am an American Puerto Rican. And I just happened to be the daughter of a man who fought during World War II, the niece of a Korean Purple Heart, and I was raised to love this nation and the values it stands for. And I voted for the first time, and I am 70 years old. Wow. I'm proud. My heart goes for that vote, whichever it had been. And basically it has been for value, integrity, and diversity. Puerto Ricans, we're not white, we're not black, we're not Indians, we're everything. And we wish, I wish that we were more, okay? Now, my concern is, you spoke about how Puerto Ricans uh, affected the vote in Florida, how Puerto Ricans affected the vote in New York. Tell me about Puerto Ricans in Philadelphia. Because we have a lot of Puerto Ricans here, and I'm proud sister of two of them who have successfully made their lives over here. So I'd like that, an answer to that question about the blue wave. How has it, the Puerto Ricans have affected that so-called blue wave, which was one of the questions posted for this activity? And what can you tell me about it? I'd like to know more about Puerto Ricans and their efforts to be heard as truthful, truthful American citizens. I'll just say Thank a couple you. things. Um, <clears throat> Latinos have been underrepresented in city offices for a long time here in Philadelphia. Uh, there's a lot of potential reasons for that. One of them that's been brought up is um, uh, undervoting by Latino voters, not as many Latinos voting as people would expect. Um, 
Secondly, uh, Councilwoman Maria Quinona Sanchez is Puerto Rican, um, and I, uh, she's one of the people that people talk about when they talk about the 2023 mayor's race, which is a long ways off, um, but I think that she is definitely a potential candidate there. So the, the just two things I wanted to say. Yeah, I think it's, it's hard to, to separate out Puerto Ricans because all the stats that I've seen don't separate out Puerto Ricans um, specifically, right? They do black, they do Latino, they do uh, white, um, and, and then they do gender, men and women, but they don't separa separate out Puerto Ricans um, specifically. So I don't know that any of us can answer a question specifically about Puerto Ricans. What I can say in Philadelphia is that, yes, we are the poorest big city in America, and that poverty is concentrated in black and Latino communities. So one in three blacks uh, in Philadelphia lives in poverty. Two in five Latinos in Philadelphia lives in poverty. And so that's an issue I think that we have to address in terms of the Puerto Rican community, um, along with the gentrification that's pushed Puerto Ricans out of some of the traditional areas in Philadelphia where they've lived, like Spring Garden. Uh, there's a documentary called Quentos by a guy named Gilberto Gonzalez that kind of traces that history here in Philadelphia that you might want to uh, look at to kind of look at where Puerto Ricans were, where they are now, and, and what issues they're facing going forward. But I think, again, when you look at the issues that uh, bring us together in Philadelphia, poverty has to be one of them. Uh, and that is an issue that affects uh, the Puerto Rican community as well as, as, as the black community disproportionately. Let me just say the hour of eight o'clock having come and gone, we'll take one more question. And who stole the mic this time? There we go. Thank you. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the suburbs um, and I think it was interesting that they're not totally monolithic and we saw in the Philadelphia region in particular differences between Holly mentioned Bucks County and the western suburbs, not just at the congressional level, where of course we talked about Fitzpatrick and Wallace, but even down ticket, um, Democrats winning a swathe of state house seats, state senate seats in Chester, Delco, Monco, but with the exception of I think Steve Sanicero, pretty much not winning anything in Bucks County. Um, so what what explains that? Is that is that demographics? Is that educational attainment? Is that the the presence of a Whole Foods or the lack thereof? I don't. Um, let me know. Thank you. I mean, I think part of it, when you look at the congressional level, despite all the trends that we analyze, it partly still comes down to candidate quality. Um, and Brian Fitzpatrick is probably one of the best positioned Republicans in Congress to run in this environment. And as Holly has written and others have said, you know, he did not have the greatest uh, challenger. So I think at least at the congressional level, I can't speak as much to the local level. I don't cover that as closely, but that that that's a big factor there. And when you look at the kind of waves in the other direction, the fact that Tom MacArthur lost in South Jersey, him and Fitzpatrick, you know, were the two incumbents who seemed like they might have a shot to hold on. And, um, and so that shows you that there was a, a really powerful surge in these, in these suburbs. And, and to me, Fitzpatrick is a case of strong incumbent and not a very strong challenger. Yeah, we're getting a little nerdy here maybe, but I mean, if you look at the presidential vote in 2016, Bucks County was the closest of the suburban, and you know, and Democrats did make some noise in the suburban. I mean, Tina Davis very came within like 67 votes of defeating an incumbent state senator, and Helen Ty almost, I mean, almost held that seat. So you're right that it wasn't quite as impressive as it was in the other counties, but um, they made some progress. It is a dorky question, but um, I love dorky questions, <laughs> and I have actually been looking into this question: um, Why was Bucks County different, and why has it been different for several years? Um, I think in this election that having Brian Fitzpatrick in the middle of the ticket helped Republicans. Um, some Republican analysts have told me that, that if you, know, you have voters who are willing to be swing voters on him, then they're more willing to give consideration to Republican candidates down the ballot for state house and state senate as well. That rings true enough. Um, I think that the Democratic Party in other suburbs has just also been stronger um, in past years, and they built upon that, those strengths this year. But what about the Whole Foods voters, Holly? What about 
question. I don't know how many Whole Foods <laughs> there Whole Foods are. Whole Foods is key. Whole Foods. I know, I know John's voter. trying to wrap this thing up, but let me just make a quick point on that. You know, there's this next year's an election year too. I hate the term midterm election because it implies that the only important elections are presidential elections and midterms are sort of half important. <laughs> They're all important. And next year, there's going to be these battles in all these suburbs about county council races and borough and township races and Philadelphia, the whole city council. So it all still matters and we should all stay interested and involved. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> all of us want to thank you all for coming out. There, trust me, there is nothing that warms the heart of any journalist than to have people that are actually interested yes. in their government and their politics so and true. their news. Absolutely. So thank you all. And now we should thank them all. <laughs>